I'm excited to be here to talk to you all about inner source, one of my most favorite topics. Um, as mentioned, um, Natalie Bradley, I'm a director of customer success architects um, at GitHub. I've been here for about four and a half years. Uh, time absolutely flies. Um, but prior to my time here, I've spent about 12 years working with large enterprise organizations and government agencies on everything from change management, business process alignment and digital transformations, um, all of which collaboration and transparency are key. Uh, in 2016, I was introduced to my first inner source initiative and I slowly started to build on my experiences with change management to um, put together a plan or a foundation of what I've seen to be successful for inner source initiatives. And that's what I'm gonna share with you today. Um, so first things first, in case there is anyone on this call that is new, I wanna make sure we're level setting, we're all on the same page. What is inner source? Um, inner source takes the lessons learned from developing open source software and applies them to the way companies develop software internally. The goals of inner source are primarily around enabling your talented workforce to share, collaborate, and build uh, off other projects and resources or with, um, to have collaboration as a cultural norm, not as an exception, um, to facilitate the reuse of components, and to ultimately have happier engineers and developers, better features, all faster. So now that we understand what it is, what our goals are, how do we get it? How do we build an inner source culture? We've all heard the saying, probably, hopefully, that culture eats strategy for breakfast. And to be clear, uh, Peter Drucker didn't uh, mean to say that strategy was unimportant. Um, inner source strategy is a critical component of success. And we'll talk about that in a little bit here. But no matter how well designed your strategic plan is, it will fall flat unless your team shares the appropriate culture around it. Org leaders focus on strategy because it's formal logic. Um, you create company goals, you orient your people around it. It provides clarity, it has focus for the collective action and for your decision making. But the challenge with culture is that it's completely elusive, right? It's the unspoken behaviors, it's the mindsets, it's the social patterns of your people in your organization. It so often perplexes organizational leaders that they either let it go unmanaged or they relegate it to HR. And that's where it becomes a secondary concern for the business. And that is a huge mistake because when consciously managed, Culture can help achieve change. It can build organizations that will thrive in even the most of trying times. And I'm pretty sure that all of you can agree in the last two years, and as we move forward, we've got some serious trying times and culture is really defining how we survive through that. So to do this, to influence your culture and build an inner source program that is successful, we must build a strong foundation. You can use any foundation analogy you've heard um, I'm going to go with the standard kind of the house foundation uh, analogy, right? Your house isn't going to last through a hurricane uh, without a proper foundation. Your bathrooms aren't going to work without your plumbing, uh, your water lines, you need electric, you need septic, and so on. And the same goes for inner source. It requires those building blocks to create plans to implement the changes within your organization that are ultimately going to create norms that become your inner source culture. So these building blocks aren't anything new. You're not going to be like, whoa, I can't believe that she's sharing all this info. But individually, these things are so often either overlooked or just kicked to the side. We'll get to it later. And they never seem to come back up again. When we do them all together, we do them up front with intention at the beginning of our inner source journey, we really can build and influence lasting change. Okay, so what are they? First is strategy. As I mentioned earlier, strategy is critical as a part of your overarching plan for um, inner source. And that's exactly what it is, right? It's the highest level of how are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Next is policy. Policy is the governance and the compliance piece where you're defining the rules of the game, basically. Uh, communication, all about bringing awareness and consistency to your program. It's helping others understand why and how you're doing this. 
And lastly, and as importantly, is the actual culture and rewards piece, building in repeatability and normalcy to your inner source practices to encourage and reward people for doing so. So let's start with strategy. This isn't to be confused with tactical plans. A lot of organizations that I've worked with start with the tactical plan. Okay, who is the program we're going to start with? Who are the people? What are the teams, et cetera? And while that is super important for execution, we wanna take a step back first and look at a higher level strategy of your organization, right? Who are the resources that are gonna implement the plan? Um, what are their timelines? What are our measurements? Do we have goals for this program? Um, very important, does leadership support this effort? And a lot of organizations will say, yep, I've got a thumbs up, we can go forth and do good. It's not a nice to have. Leadership buy-in is really critical because it's going to help you balance your prioritization of efforts. When you have a team that's mixed between receiving a ton of pull requests or um, questions and has just what they feel to be a backlog of inner source initiatives, well, they also have a backlog of program initiatives. Leadership is really what's going to help them prioritize between those efforts. Um, you also want to look at boundaries and limitations within your organizations. Um, do you have a lot of contractors? Do you have IP concerns? Do you have sensitive programs? Um, maybe you've got a lot of research and development projects that are out there that you need restrictions on, um, classification issues. Um, there are definitely legal limitations to some organizations in what can be shared and how it can be used. We see this a lot in highly regulated companies or government organizations where there are numerous third-party contractors. However, what I'm, I find a lot is there's a ton of what we call folk law. And folk law affects your organizational success in a very big way. Folk law isn't a rule or a law or even a regulation, but more of a practice or a standard um, that was established way back in the day, and it's just become the way things are done. Uh, how come we can't do this? Well, that's just because how we've always done it. You hear that a lot in organizations when they're trying to implement change. It's because that's how it's always been done. Fact finding, doing the research to understand, is it actually something we can't do, an actual limitation? Or is this just folk law that we've all kind of absorbed and accepted as part of the norm? Um, folk law is the hardest hurdle often to overcome, but it will have the biggest impact on change once it's established and um, overturned, so to speak. Uh, next is policy. Policy takes on that perspective, takes on the perspective of your security folks, your legal, uh, your governance compliance team, and ultimately your rule, uh, users. Your policy is the rules of the game. You want to define the kind of permissions and settings you're going to have on your code and on your repositories. Um, you're going to want to have a real understanding of what your access controls are for each repo, for organizations, for those one-offs or private um, programs and organizations you have. Um, as you've defined in your strategy where you may have some limitations, how does that get implemented as a rule or a policy? What are the boundaries around that that you want to establish for all of your teams? This not only helps your business peers, like security and legal and compliance, understand how your teams and individuals will function, but it also sets the ground rules for your users so you can take off um, running. So from here, you've defined an overarching strategy. How are we doing this? Why are we doing this? And who is going to be leading this? You focus in on the policies and the compliance, the rules of the game of how we're going to implement this, what it's actually going to look like within our organization. And now it's all about the communications. Communication is so often pushed to the side. It's um, often either just forgotten about or leveraged only when absolutely required. But it's so important to be communicating regularly with everyone as early as possible. Your business partners, your peer organizations, security, they should be one of the first groups that you talk to, um, legal, your regulatory team, whoever the case may be. Information builds trust. This is all about transparency. Here's everything that we're doing. We're opening the kimono and showing you all of the stuff that's happening within our project plans, how we're building this and why. People should never hear about your inner source initiative just because you're going to kick it off 
or because it isn't working. And I see that all the time in organizations where they might have one piece of communication that's gone out to the team, we're gonna do this thing. And then it kind of falls on the vine and you never hear about it again. These um, can be forms of newsletters, blog posts, monthly workshops, meetups. Intersource Commons is a phenomenal example of what your organization should try to achieve too. We probably will never get to these levels in most places, but they're constantly putting out information, right? Visualize something similar within your organization. Um, if you feel that you don't have enough communications to be putting in front of your teams about Intersource, make it information just about software development. What are you doing in your organization around software development? What kind of tools are you using? Throw out some information about the specifics features that a team is creating or about um, a success, perhaps even a security update. What you're ultimately doing here is pushing the culture towards one of openness and transparency, and you're really creating communications as a norm, not as an exception. So your teams now are gonna have their eye out for this kind of information. They're gonna know where to look, they're gonna be more informed, and they're going to know um, how to go about this journey that they're on without surprises or reprimands at the end as you move forward. And lastly, um, but as important, is culture and rewards. And all of these building blocks are shifting your culture in and of themselves. You're being transparent, you're being open, you're defining your plans and setting yourself up for success. But there are definitely things you need to do to actually build in to make this a norm. And this is where things like training and learning paths come to play. Training doesn't ever sound like culture, right? But it's absolutely showing your people within your organization that inner source is a business practice. It's a large part of how you build software and it is important enough to make it a required annual refresher around it. Um, you can make inner source practices part of onboarding, whether it be training or actually performing like an inner source activity. At GitHub, um, every new hire is required to go into their team repo, post a picture of themselves, write a little bit of something about themselves. They're using the um, pull request um, method so that they actually kind of like dip their toe and this is how things are done. I commit something, I have someone review it and it is accepted. I've actually worked uh, with organizations that require new hires to review documentation or submit a PR or fixes for a totally different project. Something they're just interested in, they go to that project, they review documentation, they try something out, and if they find any kind of inconsistency or a fix, they submit a PR. Um, this is something that's not only defining inner source in an actual usable, movable way, but it gets them to participate in the behavior, recognizing it as an activity that's accepted by the company, right? The earlier people do these activities, if you think about onboarding your first couple of weeks, 30, 60 days, um, they're doing this in their role. They learn that it's not just okay to do this, but it's encouraged and even accepted. And rewards falls in the same place, right? Um, it significantly helps build the groundwork to get people to participate. There's so many times where I've heard inner source fail because people think it's adding too much work on their plate. So defining what that work's going to look like is going to be huge, but also rewarding them for doing it, making it show the value that, that what they put into it, they're receiving as well. And there's so many different ways to re reward your teams. It does not have to be money. Um, well, meaning money never hurts, of course, but people want to do cool things and they want to talk about it. It's so much fun to see an organization create an intranet or a blog site and have success stories posted there, or even do monthly webcasts um, which gives your teams pure bragging rights about the things that they did. Um, people want to do cool things. They love to talk about it. And it's not only for them motivating and inspiring for their, but also for their peers to learn from another, from one another um, is an awesome way to build your team talent. So these are the building blocks um, that create a solid foundation for long lasting inner source. And as I've already mentioned, they aren't anything new but individually they're so frequently overlooked or passed by that they just create problems later on. 
So I wanna look at some real world examples where organizations have just taken a couple of these steps to show you um, how they, they don't quite build the foundation that you're looking for. So the first one is an airline company. Um, they'd been trying to build an inner source program for years. Um, and when I started to talk to them, they were just about ready to give up. Um, this company had um, leadership buy-in, they had resources, they were funded. Um, so they didn't understand what was going on. It was an opt-in, um, an opt-in inner source program, which is totally fine, but they didn't have any communications around it. No one knew how to do it. Um, they lacked incentives um, and there was uh, no value prop or understanding of what they were doing. Um, teams often think inner source initiatives, as I mentioned already, right, without the product proper setup or communications is just more work, especially for your teams maintaining really popular um, programs or resources. We're, we were able to turn their efforts around because of all of the work that they had put into it initially pretty easily. Um, and they now have a really successful program. And all it really took was ensuring they understood what their strategy was, they had policies, and they communicated around what it was that they were establishing. Um, next is, I see there's a, uh, some comments in the chat that I have not checked. Claire, can you let me know if I need to answer any questions? I don't know if I... You're good, Natalie. We'll, we'll cover those in the Q&A. Okay, perfect. Um, next is a financial services company. Um, they too were um, resourced and funded, but by an individual engineering team. So they did not have leadership buy-in. It was a centralized capability and they did not have any kind of value proposition put out for the teams. So work was constantly getting prioritized over any other efforts. And again, everyone saw their initiatives as being more work with no reward. Um, so we worked together to um, develop an enterprise strategy. We sought leadership buy-in um, and we were able to create such a really cool badging system for participants. Um, they're completely off to the races. Um, now you can see in individual emails, um, some of them have their badge in their email address or in their email signature block. Um, you can click on the badge and it actually will take you to their program or a project they created. Um, that one's really turned around well. Um, they were just missing a couple of the components. The last one is code.gov. And this is example where they had leadership buy-in, they did not have support. This wasn't really a true, or isn't really a true um, inner source project. It's, um, it's mostly metadata and um, networking. Um, but they made inner source intersourcing their um, components a requirement, but it was never enforced and it really wasn't even monitored um, at all, whether organizations were doing this at all. Um, I have not personally been a part of this initiative, but it created such a negative stance for a lot of number of government organizations saying that intersource just isn't for the government, we can't make it work. Um, but I have since worked with a lot of government agencies and have helped them to create really awesome inner source programs. Um, my personal favorite is an intelligence community customer that I'd love to tell you about, but I can't because it's a secret. Um, and that's really it. Um, like I said, nothing earth shattering or crazy, um, but if you build it, they will come. And if you build it right and all together, uh, it will absolutely last. So don't forget that when you are embarking on your initiatives, inner source is a cultural transformation as much as it is anything else. It requires building blocks to make elusive behaviors shift. So be patient, be consistent, and always celebrate even the smallest of wins with your team. It truly builds um, morale and incentives.